Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about reservoir modeling and simulation. So there's another one on basic primer series. And the key thing here is to some extent, it's not a sausage machine, or it shouldn't be a sausage machine, but a very important tool for forecasting development and performance of your oil fields. So what and why? Well, a reservoir model is a mathematical simulation which predicts the production performance of, a, of an oil field or gas field. It's used to formulate optimum development plans, effectively manage the reservoir, understand what's going on basically. But key point to bear in mind is it's an estimate, it's not reality. It contains a whole bunch of data produced by a whole bunch of people. Uh, geophysicists, geologists, petrophysicists, geochemists, um, data from well testing, etc. And it's all integrated together to, in one mathematical model. And the results produced are production profiles uh, based on different production scenarios. And we're trying to use the, those to select the best scheme to, to develop economically. And as you get new data, you update your model uh, through time. And that's very important. And also reservoir modeling techniques are used in other fields, for example, planning carbon capture and storage, also to some extent for pollution monitoring and uh, some other uh, geological and geophysical and geotechnical uh, applications. So reservoir models for field life. So this is the NP cycle. So first you explore, then you appraise, then you develop, then you produce. And key thing is, is the further you are here, the more data you get. So initially you start off doing various probabilistic estimator uh, estimations in something, for example, GeoX. And I've got a whole video on this particular thing, uh, either deterministic or, or a probabilistic estimation of, uh, of hydrocarbon volumes. So I'll link that in the description. Then you move to a map-based model, so you, in a deterministic sense now, then you end up building geocellular models using something like Betrayal, Skewer, GoCAD, etc., and other of these, uh, other these uh, uh, software suites. Then you move to a dynamic simulator using something like Eclipse, which was developed by my stepfather. Uh, and you can use limited scenarios or more scenarios, etc. And then eventually you will have extra data and extra analyticals to help you uh, validate your model. So what goes into a model? Well, you've got seismic data, geophysical interpretation, that's what I do. You've got log data with petrophysical interpretation, that's also linked to geophysics. You've got geological interpretation, that's also kind of linked to geophysics as well. You've got fluid data, uh, pressure, volume, temperature, I'll talk a little bit about that. And all of that's put together in this thing called the shared earth model, and I'll describe how that is in a minute. Then you have, will have production data through time, and you will do something called history match, and again, I'll talk a little bit about that. And what comes out is you get your production forecasts, so how much you're going to produce under different scenarios. Uh, you can use that to manage your risk and uncertainty, and you can use that to manage your development planning, both first phase development and also uh, redevelopment and upgrades later on in field life. So this is a graphic from IFP, Institut Francais Petrol, uh, with all the different models that come in through here. So you've got your structural models, your stratigraphical models, then you make a reservoir grid, and then you do flow simulations. And then you put various other data that you use to update that. So first thing you do is you build a static geocellular model. So this is built in a software like Betrayal or Skewer or GoCAD. And you do FASIS modeling, which is looking at different rock types. Uh, you do layering, which I'll come to in a second. Shapes of various geobodies, so how the individual rock units behave. Um, the bodies can be generated by a computer model based on parameters defined by a geologist. So that was a lot of stochastic modeling that started developing in the late 1990s. You can also use seismic data to help constrain that and use this as the main input to your reservoir simulator. You can also slice and dice the model, view it in 3D, try to understand what's going on. But again, some of the features are generated by a computer um, and several more different models would usually be generated. Some would be generated by a deranged geologist and I've met some pretty deranged geologists. Lovely people though they are. So a little bit about reservoir layering and zonation. So zonation is done by correlation. So effectively what you're looking at is these are logs. So this is a uh, for example, a gamma ray log. So these are sand bodies, these are shale bodies, and you're trying to connect the different sand bodies. Trying to see which ones will talk to each other, which one will flow together. So where the fluids will flow through the individual sand body. Look at where the barriers are, the vertical barriers. So various tools are used to that, uh, biostratigraphy using fossil markers, because obviously you have, um, these things will be laid out over quite a considerable length of time. And each one of these shales will contain different bio units and you can correlate the two shales together. You can look at log signature. So things that look the same, like this sandstone here, that looks like it's all connected. Chemistratigraphy for geochemical mar markers, 
pressure data helps validate it. So if this has a different pressure to that, obviously there's a barrier between the two of them. Something doesn't quite work. And you can use something called sequence stratigraphy to fit that into sequence stratigraphic framework. So how it all gets deposited and how it all works together. And you may make different stratigraphic schemes, which may need to be modeled depending on what uh, data you have that's coming in. Compartmentalization. Uh, so this is uh, splitting up the reservoir into different compartments. Usually, mainly it's faulting. So you have these faults, and each one of these different fault panels would have slightly different pressures, slightly different temperatures, maybe even slightly different fluids. The more compartments you have, the more wells you need, the more cost you, you will also incur. Also, if you're doing a water flood, uh, pressure support using a water injection, uh, an injector here may not provide pressure support to this compartment here. Compartments can be used for by sealing faults. So, for example, this uh, cartoon here from the Brent Province in the North Sea, or by layering uh, regional shales to provide vertical separation, etc. And again, it's one of these things we look at. And each of the faults will also have something called a damage zone, which will reduce permeability locally around the uh, the fault uh, plane, up to you know 50, 100 meters aside. May also act as an enhancement in uh, if you're looking for fractures. Fluids PVT. Now, our best people to talk to are these guys, Petroface, so that's my uh, former colleagues, Brian Moffat and uh, Mike Fawcett. Please check them out. But pressure, volume, and temperature is how different fluids behave within an oil field. You get fluids obtained from uh, MDT sampling, uh, so that's a, a wireline sampling tool from the production uh, stream, etc., uh, from well tests. But there are potential issues with contamination, degradation due to poor storage. You get key information, so fluid composition. So this uh, chron uh, chronograph here, uh, gas oil ratio, constant gas ratio, contaminants such as H2S, CO2, etc., waxes, uh, bane of my life in one of the previous project. And you can try to calculate volumetric factors and use this as a key input to the reservoir simulator. So please talk to Brian and, uh, and Mike uh, if you need any more stuff on your, on your fluids. Then you move into the realm of dynamic simulation. So you've got a static model, you're happy with that. You now need to try to figure out what's going on in terms of production. So you initialize the model and there are different types of simulators. There's black oil, which effectively looks at uh, a pure oil phase and compositional, which has uh, compositional changes uh, within the model. And this is where the PVT comes in as a key uh, component. You can also couple the model with storage facilities, couple it with a geomechanical model, and get really complicated. And it's there to give you a forecast of what's likely to be happening and where you're going to go to. So here's some examples. So you've got different types of, uh, of volumes. Uh, so this is a, a front of uh, pressure moving through a simulator. So you're moving from grain to layer, etc. So what you're really coming up with is, for example, saturation, prediction of pressure, prediction of flow and conductivity. But again, it's a simulation. It's a variable tool. Each of these uh, models contains a cell. Now, a cell is uh, described here um, is effectively, a, a, for example, 50 by 50 meters in, in area and a thickness of between five and 10 meters or the reservoir layer thickness. Sometimes you may wish to thicken, uh, increase the number of cells and uh, increase the cell density. And you can imagine cells can run into millions, which takes quite a lot of computational uh, time, which is where the uh, parallel cluster computing has really helped. So trade-off between number of cells for accuracy versus runtime of the model. If your model takes several days to run, that can be a bit of a pain in the butt. Now, when I first started, all models used to take several days to run. Now it's a little bit better. And upscaling is trying to incorporate heterogeneity because, you, as you can see here, there's a lot of complexity. You can't really fully model that because you just need too many cells. So you try to put a factor in there to try to compensate for that. So effectively, you look at each cell and you have equations of state that describe the movement of fluids and pressures between the two different cells. It's how to handle your uncertainty? Well, multiple models. When I first started, you'd build several deterministic models. Um, with different rock properties, for example, permeability, KVKH ratios, that's vertical versus horizontal permeability, thickness of different units, extent, you can switch faults on and off. So you can do quite complicated scenario modeling and you come up with a tornado chart like that. So change in all place, change of production. So you can try to focus what key uncertainties are and try to put your geological and uh, engineering effort to try and understand what they are and try to understand the risks associated with that. And it also gives us an idea of what could happen. 
Now, key thing is updating the models with the new data. You may think you have built a perfect model, but um, as Mike Tyson said, reality has this unpleasant uh, uh, way of punching you in the mouth. No plan survives uh, contact with the enemy, etc., etc., etc. So initially, you will have changes. For example, you have basic uh, seismic data, you have your core, you have your fluid samples, which you'll obtain during the expiration. So again, this is exploration, appraisal, development, and production. So then you'll have some dynamic data. Uh, so for example, initially you'll have some uh, well tests, uh, where you open up the well for a short amount of time, you know, several hours, and then from that you will get um, uh, data. Then you have uh, your production data, rates, volumes, etc. when you start to produce, and then you may also have seismic, uh, 40 seismic, time-lapse seismic, to try to monitor what's going on. And again, as you get further on, you get more data, you need to update stuff, your model, to make sure that everything works. Uh, There's a model called history matching. Now, what history matching is, is when you effectively run, uh, do a backcast. You build your model to where it is, and then you run it for the production data that you have. And then if the model doesn't fit, you adjust your model until it does. Obviously, if your model doesn't fit the previous production data that you've already had, something's clearly wrong and you need to fix that. And you iteratively match it and you do multiple models until you get all the certainty uh, that you fully understand. So here's an example of something I did during my professional life. So it's a North Sea field. We had significant volumetric uncertainty despite having some production. Uh, we needed to make a decision on expansion plan. We built three reservoir models using a low case depth conversion, mid case depth conversion, high case depth conversion. All of these were history matched. The low case model we couldn't get to match. So obviously it was somewhere within this area, either the mid case or the high case. Gave us confidence to proceed with the development plan, which turned out okay. Then you have uh, validation by the analytical methods. Now you need production data to be able to do that. So for example, you have material balance using equations to determine producer volume of hydrocarbons in the field. That's what people used to do before simulation. Uh, still a valid uh, tool and gives you validation that your model is somewhere near correct. P over Z, pressure versus volume. So you remember from high school, uh, PZ, PZ equals NRT. Uh, you know the ideal gas equation. Again, pressure declines, the gas is produced. You plot the two together. And from that, within that, you can get an idea of what's going on. Decline curves, again, use quite a lot in shale. Basically, it's a way of trying to constrain your model. And does your model actually work? You can link your models above and below ground. So this is a picture, again, from my friend Brian Moffat with Petroface. So you have a reservoir engineer's perspective with a heck of a lot of complexity and a very small process. And you have the process engineer complexity. Ah, it's just a black box. And um, you have all this wonderful gubbins up the top. Now. I understand this. I don't really understand that. I kind of appreciate that something complicated is going on. But the key point here that Brian makes is that the two sides kind of have to talk to each other. And to sum up, the reservoir model is a figment of a geologist and engineer's imagination. Let's be honest, it is. But it needs to be based on real data and needs validation. Use your models to forecast, decision making, planning, etc., supporting the booking of your reserves. But probably. Best not to be like David Bailey, the famous British photographer from the 1960s, and fall in love with your models. Don't fall in love with your models. If you're a photographer or a reservoir engineer, use your models to forecast, use your models to guide, but always check, always validate. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.